All right. So welcome to uh, Psalm 118. Um, it's a psalm of thanksgiving, and it's one of the more significant psalms in all the scripture. So if you picked up a bunch of the, uh, of the Bible and you kind of looked at what do we have here, you'd see you've got this huge section, the biggest section by far, um, of psalms. And those psalms have... Um, very, <laughs> I'm kind of distracted by me. And, but anyway... Um, the longest psalm is 119, and the shortest psalm is 117. So in between, you've got 118. Amazing how those numbers work. And as uh, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, the psalms were collated and put together, uh, this psalm stuck out as a really significant one. So we're going to look at it. I'll also look at the one before it, no extra charge. And um, the reason I picked this is tells us we're supposed to be praising God for his goodness and his hesed or loyal love towards us. I'm sure all of you have had some experience where you've sat around a Thanksgiving table and people have gone around and said all the things they're thankful for, which normally comes down to uh, food, things, and maybe relationships. Um Maybe if you were Jewish, you were thankful for the fact that you're able to celebrate the Passover a year later and got there. So there, there are other reasons for it. But there isn't usually a whole lot of um, God doing things for us. Uh, if you're in Christian circles, you'd hear about things like, uh, oh, I'm so grateful for my salvation or my church or you know the word, but it's kind of more generic. And uh, this time I kind of got into it looking mainly at goodness and hesed, thinking I wanted to elaborate on God's goodness and hesed, but then I found so much cool stuff in this that I thought um, I would want to share it with you, and hopefully it will bless you as it did me. Um, psalm 118 is Martin Luther's favorite psalm. So um, you all know Martin Luther was a great reformer. It's because of him that we have salvation by faith, actually because of Jesus and God we have salvation by faith, but he was the one who kind of recaptured it uh, in the midst of the uh, dominion of the Holy Roman Empire. And he led a life that was uh, pretty turbulent. Uh, he was a monk, he actually was teaching at a uh, theology college, and uh, it was then after being a doctor of theology and being a professor that he came across his first copy of a Bible. And uh, unfortunately for some, he started reading it, and it basically changed his life and his views and uh, Christianity as a result. Um, he was hounded and persecuted. Uh, there were death threats against him. Um, the emperor, not the emperor, but the prince of uh, Germ one of the German uh, kingdoms, uh, basically had to put him in, uh, take him into safe custody uh, because people were trying to kill him so much. And he had actually a, a verse from this, I'll show it to you later, that he had uh, written out and stuck on the wall of his study. So uh, it meant a lot to him. And he says, this is my psalm, my chosen psalm. I love them all. I mean, I love all Holy Scripture. And then he says, Scripture is my consolation and my life. Which is why God used the guy. But this psalm is nearest to my heart, and I have a peculiar right to call it mine. It has saved me from many a pressing danger, from which neither emperor, nor kings, nor sages, nor saints could have saved me. It is, my friends, dearer to me than all the honors and power of the earth. That's a phenomenal testimony for a guy who uh, basically changed the face of Christianity. Um, and this psalm meant so much to him. And I think most believers kind of read through it thinking, wow, 117 was easy, and oh no, I got 119 here. I might as well see what's here, and then let's see if I can somehow get through 119 to the end. And there's lots of great stuff in it. So let's see if I can actually turn two things on at once without causing too much trouble. Okay. Zoom it. There it is. Okay. So Psalm 117 is so short. Um, it mentions two things about God, his hesed and his truth. Praise the Lord, uh, all you Gentiles, which is kind of interesting. Laud him, all you peoples, which shows that 
the God of the scriptures is a God of not just the Jews. And the reason we should praise him is because his hesed is great towards us and his faithfulness endures forever. Praise the Lord. So praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Two things to praise him for. Uh, he is um, his hesed and his faithfulness. Uh, some of the versions say truth, but uh, the thing that uh, most best translates it in most of the spots where it shows up is the fact that God is faithful to his people. And it's also significant that it's the Gentiles that are supposed to be praising him for it, which means that the blessing of Abraham would get through the Jews to the Gentiles and they would praise him. The setting is the post-exile. So after the nation of Israel went into exile uh, to Babylon for their sin, after their sister country to the north, uh, and other ten tribes went into Assyria and never came back, uh, 70 years later, after the first generation had been disciplined by death in Babylon, the, a few of them, of that, that generation, came back with a new generation under guys like Ezra and Nehemiah and Zerubbabel and rebuilt the things. The, the context of this is most commentators think of Nehemiah 8. Um, it describes the Feast of Tabernacles. And the Feast of Tabernacles was the seventh of the... Um, festivals that the Lord mandated for his people. So it was like after Passover, uh, and it, they had this one-week festival where people would dwell in tents, uh, called tabernacles or booths. And they would recall the desert wanderings of their ancestors who disobeyed at Kadesh Barnea, and for all those years they wandered in the wilderness while God took care of them, and then came back um, to pro um, to get into the promised land. So here this, these, this, these Israelites have coming out of the Babylonian exile. They have rebuilt the wall under Nehemiah. They rebuilt the temple under Zerubbabel and Ezra. And the, this particular psalm, if you notice down here, I've got this little thing called Hallel. Uh, these are praise psalms. So you might have heard the words Alleluia, which means Hallel, Yah, praise Yah. And they would be sung every Passover. They'd sing a couple before, they'd sing some afterwards. And the last one is our psalm, Psalm 118. This would have been the last song that Jesus sung before he got betrayed in the garden. So it's kind of the last the thing that would be most resonating in his thoughts as he went out um, to get betrayed by Judas. It's significant on multiple levels. It mentions Jesus has the rejected cornerstone, and it's got some great stuff in it. So let's start Psalm 118. Uh, we should give thanks. Let's see if we can get up here to the end. Oops, too far over. And praise to God, for he is infinitely good and loyal to his covenant promises. So if we look down here, it says, I'll give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, and his hesed endures forever. And then the piece of that that they're supposed to pick up is hesed, hesed, hesed. Thing. So the, the first thing that our relationship with God is rooted in is the fact that he is good. The first lie that Eve was fed by Satan was, God is not good. And as I've been, you know, watching people for 40 years uh, struggle with their relationships with God, uh, the thing that causes the most difficulties is they don't believe God is good. Why not? Because he doesn't do what they want. So uh, we need to understand that even if God doesn't do what he wants, he is infinitely good and everything that comes from him is for our benefit. Then the psalmist now recognizes that there's a reason to explain why he is good. And he is always loyal to his covenant. 
Uh, if you just think of loving kindness, you totally miss the meaning of this word in scripture. He is always loyal to his covenant. So even though he disciplined the nation of Israel and that whole generation, you know, actually multiple generations got wiped out at different times, he was still loyal to his promises to the nation. And actually his discipline of them was loyal to his promises as well. He said, if you obey me, I will bless you. If you disobey me, I will curse you. So the psalmist then says, let Israel say, his tested endures forever. Let the house of Aaron say, his tested endures forever. So you think, okay, he's gone for the whole people. Then he's narrowing it down to the house of Aaron. This was the priesthood. Uh, Moses and Aaron and then the Levites came, were from the Levitical tribe of Levites. And then there's a big debate among scholars. They debate stuff like this as to who verse four is. Some say he's broadened it to anyone who fears the Lord like the Gentiles. Um, others say he's narrowing it down yet further to those within that camp that fear the Lord. Um, either argument has um, its proponents and its flaws, but the thing that is for sure is those who fear the Lord, who are careful to do what he wants, need to um, understand and remember and proclaim that his loyalty endures forever because the blessings of God are given to those who fear him. So whichever way you want to take it, either way, the net thing is fearing God is important. Now, this is tough psalm because it is antiphonal, which means there's like, uh, if you go to some churches where they have liturgical readings, one guy says something, and the congregation says something, you go back and forth. This has multiple parts. It's almost like the Song of Solomon, where there's like in, really hard to figure out who the speakers are, and people have proposed all kinds of various schemes. Um, it's both national uh, and personal. So what looks like a very personal, I called on the Lord. Oops, something over here. Uh, I called on the Lord in distress. And that's what we're supposed to do. We call out to him asking for help. And the Lord answered me, and he set me in a broad place. So the word for distress means confined, pressed in. Your freedom is gone. You, you have no place to go. Um, it's like those old horror movies or the James Bond movies where the, um, which some people think are the same thing, the, the, the we, uh, walls get closer and closer and closer, and you know you, you I don't know what's going to happen. Um, and then you call out for help, and then Star Wars does it too. And it's like, yeah, it's like, uh, it's in a number of these guys. Um, the Lord answers and delivers. So that should be our testimony right there uh, in verse 5, that we called on the Lord when things were getting difficult. He answered and set me in a broad place, and therefore we have grounds for praising him. And that's kind of what we do in our praise time on Sunday. Uh, then he says, the Lord's on my side. I won't fear. What can man do to me? The Lord is for me among those who help me. Um, therefore, I'll see my desire on those who don't want to help me, those who hate me. So, um, one of the things I asked you to do at the bottom, my very last question, is to go through this uh, on your own and kind of circle all the attributes of God, uh, put a little check mark among all his blessings, and then put a box around the stuff that you need to do. So, calling on the Lord in distress, that's a box around that you need to do. Lord answering, uh, that is uh, both his character. You could actually put two things around that, that he is a God who cares and answers, and he also delivers. He's on our side. Um, he's with us always, particularly as we're seeking to make disciples. And if you, know, you and God are, are a majority, um, it's kind of a... And the fact that God is our helper is just mind-boggling when you think about you know, he serves us, he helps us, he comes to our aid. He is a pretty good God who deserves our praise. The next verse is, we should trust, did I, let me go back one, sorry. We should give thanks to the God and praise him for he's infinitely good, loyal to his promises. And you know, the thing I want to pick out is when it says hesed, it's not just promises, it's obligations. 
God has bound himself to act a certain way in certain instances. So, you know, that gives us added help. I mean, added a con help to trust him. Uh, in which he is for us. He helps us. We are those who fear him. He's always on their side. He answers their prayers. He delivers them out of pressing trouble and he blesses us. So that summarizes almost all the psalm. Okay, we should trust in God only because he only is trustworthy. He alone is valiant, strong, resolute. Uh, he gives strength, he gives song, and he gives salvation to those who trust and praise him. So it's better to trust in him than to put confidence in man. It's better to trust in the Lord than put confidence in uh, princes. And if you understand some of Martin Luther's history, uh, emperors and people who promised him things failed to deliver. because Someone offered him a better deal. Um, All nations surrounded me, but in the name of the Lord, I will destroy them. So now we're going to get three destroys. Um, and the word for destroy is kind of funny. It's an intensive form of the word to circumcise. So uh, some of the commentators got, you know, s sidetracked on that and said, oh yeah, in the name of they're all these nations surrounding me, but in the name of the Lord, I will evangelize them and I will get them circumcised and they will become good Jews. Um, if you just go on, they're talking about being quenched by fire. <laughs> So, you know, it's, it's amazing how people get hooked on one verse and fail to see the context. Um, the, the word is best translated destroy or to uh, obliterate. There's actually another root that uh, this could have come from that some of the scholars have come up with that uh, more directly indicates the concept of destruction. So this could be a king, a leader, um, one of the post-exilic people. Um, Nehemiah would probably be the best guy to fit this that we know of, because he had lots of different uh, small nations uh, harassing him as he's trying to build the wall. Uh, it could be emblem emblematic of the nation of Israel, uh, because they've now returned. They were surrounded. They were uh, like almost bees to them, uh, afflicting them, and then they're gone. Uh, he addresses his enemies. You pushed me violently that I might fall but the Lord helped me. So some scholars get hung up on the fact that, you know, this is a king and they try to figure out who the king is and they make all kinds of presuppositions, none of which can be supported as a particular one. But the idea is that God is the one who fights the battles for his people. His people are those who trust him. Uh, as the, the some uh, proverb that was quoted earlier today, um, Trust in the Lord with all your heart. To, uh, do not rely on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he'll direct your paths. It starts with the trust in God. And we trust in him because he is good and he is loyal. He has promised to do certain things. Therefore, we trust him. We call out to him. He helps us. And life gets good. Any questions on those first two points? Oops, I got that. Sorry. He goes on to say that the Lord is my strength and my song, and he has become my salvation. Okay, this is kind of interesting. If you were a Jew at that time, you would know immediately that this came out of Exodus 15, because it was a song that you learned. It was the song of Moses that he sung after the nation of Israel came out through um, from Egypt. So um, in chapter 14, 31 of Exodus, they feared, they believed, they put their trust in God. And then uh, the next chapter opens up with a song of praise and one of the things that's interesting there is they praise God for being a man of war. They actually use the term for being a man of war. And most people's concept of God is, oh, God's not a man of war. Well, actually, the horse and the rider got thrown into the sea because God actually did destroy their enemies. And, you know, if you had a wimpy God, you, you wouldn't, you know, be that confident in trusting him. 
but because God is a um, mighty warrior, we have lots of verses on that one, then uh, we have grounds for trusting him. Now, we're going to have a number of places uh, in here, 21, uh, 25, and actually, uh, yeah, down below right here, I got them, um, where it says, God has become my salvation. Okay? It does not say, God is my Savior. Now, you could say it's just a poetic way of saying it, but th there's something more here going on here. Um, the relationship with God is what has resulted in their salvation, not just one act. And most people just kind of view God as a, you know, one trick pony. He dies for your sins. That's it. And, you know, he, he, he saved me. Great. But he himself is my, become my salvation. And this is one of the things I'm sure Martin Luther reflected on. Um, because it's this concept of God that gives rise to such a great attachment to the psalm that uh, you, you go to the Psalms to get a good picture of God, and he is our helper, he is our salvation. You really want to see God behind his acts. The difference between praise and thanksgivings, for the most part, is thanksgiving is for stuff and things, and praise is for the person. And uh, he, he says, the Lord is my strength, and he's my song. In other words, he sings songs about God, because God has delivered him. Um, only in God is my soul at rest. From him comes my salvation. Uh, it could probably be improved a little bit. Only in God is my soul at rest, for he is my salvation. And if you've got God, you really don't need anything else. Um, the voice of rejoicing and salvation is in the tents or tabernacles of the righteous. So this is one of the pieces that would lead people to believe that this is the Feast of Tabernacles, um, spoken of in uh, Nehemiah. Um, and they are rejoicing, and the sound of salvation, so it's not just voice, but the sound, uh, the sound of people being saved, or the fact that they are saved, uh, they are dwelling in their tents, they are eating and drinking, they are delighting and reveling in God's goodness to them. And we have another group of triples here. The right hand of the Lord does valiantly. The right hand of the Lord is exalted. The right hand of the Lord does valiantly. Um, the left hand was considered to be weaker, um, unless you were a left-handed uh, arrow slinger, which is, uh, I think those guys are pretty good. But here, to use God's right anthropomorphism, they use the metaphor of his right hand. It's a strong thing. And... Notice that stuck in between the valiant is the exalted. Um, he's the high one. There's no one better than he. He does um, great, strong things. So. Okay, now the, the tenor of the psalm kind of changes because you just have all this you know, joyful, rejoicing, everybody's happy. And then he says, I shall not die, but live. <laughs> so the way this song was compiled, you can only conject, have, you know, hazard a guess at. But um, it kind of combines the national deliverance with individual deliverance. So uh, you could have a person here in verse 17 uh, speaking of, an incident in his own life, or speaking on behalf of the uh, congregation. So what would happen in the day, uh, Feast of Tabernacles, went on for a week. Each day they would go in and they would walk around the temple once, and on the altar in the temple. And on the last day, they would walk around it seven times. That was the, And they would hold in their hands palm branches that were bound together with myrtle and you know, some other, uh, some fragrance was put in there. And they would wave it back and forth. And they would basically say, Hosanna. They would praise God for his saving acts, remembering that those time of being in the wilderness was being out of Israel. Now, does this ring any bells for people? Palm Sunday, when Jesus came in, 
people were waving the, the branches, saying, Hosanna, God saves, and uh, praising God for that. <clears throat> so, verse 17 is the plaque that Martin Luther had carved in his study. I shall not die, but live and declare the works of the Lord. For his life was in danger every day. Uh, during the Inquisition, the Counter-Reformation, um, score hundreds, thousands of Christians, uh, Protestants, were killed. And uh, there's a story told, not a story, but the history records that there are, in the space of a, a week, two Huguenot pastors. So Huguenots were French, non-Roman Catholic Christians, um, were uh, put to death for refusing to renounce Christ. So the Catholic Church was there trying to get people to renounce Jesus as their Savior. It doesn't really make sense until you realize that Satan is alive and well in religious institutions. And then a few months, uh, after, several months after that, another one was put to death. And all of them quoted this psalm before they died. So apparently Martin Luther wasn't the only one who found great comfort in it. But as he's watching his friends and his allies get uh, martyred and tortured. Um, he, his confidence was this, and he reaffirmed it. You know, every time he looked up, he saw the, the plaque and said, yes, I shall not die, but declare the works of the Lord, which kind of gave you some insight into his purpose for living. Um, and if you're not going to be declaring the works of the Lord, uh, why are you occupying space on the planet? Purpose for living, Isaiah 43, where Israel was formed for his praise. And a person who does not live for God uh, really has nothing to be living for. Uh, then this verse 18 comes in. The Lord has chastened or disciplined me severely, but he has not given me over to death. Um, this is particularly appropriate for the nation of Israel. He had disciplined them severely. The entire generation that lived in the temple in Jerusalem, where the magnificent first temple was, was put to death. The entire one. They like, you know, dead. And um, the nation, though, was not extinguished, and the nation will never be extinguished. They were scattered for oh, almost a uh, 1,000, almost 2,000 years, 1,918 years uh, until God brought the nation back into Israel. And he still is loyal to them. His scattering was foretold in Deuteronomy. His regathering is foretold in lots of the prophets. And God's purpose in chastening people is to be able to have them declare his praises, use them in the lives of others, not to kill them. So there's a cool passage that I think this uh, relates to from Jeremiah 33. Um, Thus says the Lord, Again there shall be heard in this place of which you say it is desolate. And Jeremiah, and giving voice to the uh, comments of the people, are saying, Oh yeah, there's not sound of rejoicing, there's no weddings, there's nothing, it's terrible, it's horrible, it's desolate, there's no praise, blah, 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 blah. And then God says through him, this is the chapter I think has a new covenant in it, um, the voice of joy and the voice of gladness shall be heard again. Okay? Again, heard these voices. So if you look at the original, it's kind of, kind of hard to, with the, with all the parenthetical statements. Um, and the voice of gladness and joy will say, praise the Lord of hosts. For the Lord is good, and his hesed endures forever. Just, just like our psalm is. Right? So, um, obviously, there were those who knew about Jeremiah. They put their trust in what Jeremiah revealed. They got back, and they're praising God for his goodness and his hesed, the various things that our psalm opened with. And also will be heard the voice of those who bring the sacrifice of praise into the house of the Lord. And that was what the Feast of Tabernacles was all about. They would come in to the house to praise God. 
they wouldn't be allowed in the Holy of Holies. They were real super close, but there was a spot where they were able to come in. There'd be this big procession. <clears throat> um, and I will again cause the captives of the land to return as at the first, says the Lord. And Ezra 3 has some stuff on that. So the point to remember out of this is we must not doubt when God uses difficulties to draw us into a deeper dependent relationship with him. He's working on developing dependence. He's working on developing righteousness. And instead of doubting, we should be declaring his praise. Um, there's an interesting quote that said something very similar uh, by a guy that I don't tend to like to quote. Um, but John Calvin, in being another leader of the Reformation, before his theology got um, a little screwy, um, basically had a commentary on, on this saying that God wants to deepen our relationship with him. I mean, the, this, the trick to basically enduring the trials is to recognize that God means them for our good. So recently we studied the concept of long suffering. We studied joy in the midst of trials. And you know that trials are really the cause for rejoicing because God is building good things in a person's life for the result. Uh, a key thing seems to be trust in him. And that goes back to Job. The key task that God had for Job was to trust in what uh, God's word said. All right, then we have, um, now some people end the first section of the psalm there um, at verse 18, and 19 begins a new section. Um, when I you know, first read through it, I have this uh, amazing gift of having a goldfish mind where I totally forget what I've previously read. <laughs> I remember one section of my brain, but when I'm looking at it, it's like I've never seen it before. And um, I, I went through and I kind of broke up the psalm thinking, okay, where does this fit? Yeah, this looks like this goes here, this goes here, this goes here. And then I started uh, seeing, uh, I found some commentators that had um, also agreed with me and others who had different opinions. And then I went, gee, I wonder what Daily Truth they said. <laughs> I go to Daily Truth Race and I found out, oh yeah, broke it up in the same spot there. So um, this section um, is still part of the you need to trust God section. Um, because it's got verse 22 in it about the builder rejecting a stone. But it, it kind of has these antipath antipathical things where one group is saying one thing and another group says another, and the people say one thing, the priests say another. Um, so they are getting, you know, they're doing their pilgrimage to Jerusalem. That's the setting that a lot of people would posit for this. And they say, open to me the gates of righteousness, and I will go through them and I will praise the Lord. Um, this is not the gate to the temple. Uh, this is the gate to the city. And the city was the city where righteousness was supposed to dwell. And the gates of righteousness to which they need to go through were those for people to be able to do righteousness uh, or where righteousness was found. Uh, there's another thing in the Psalms, uh, I think four, it's got, um, Psalm 4, where it talks about the gates of death and kind of comparing righteousness and life versus death. You have the gates of righteousness and life, the gates of death. And I was trying to figure out how to explain the, the, the gates of death. What, what are they? The gates of Hades. Uh, it's the gate beyond which is death. Um, it's the gate beyond which the dead go. Uh, going a similar parallel, Gates of righteousness is the gates beyond which people are righteous, uh, the gates through which the righteous go. And most of the commentators would come up with this idea of uh, gates of righteousness are the ones through which the righteous go. It, it's not precise enough, but uh, it's hard to nail it down even further. But he says, I will go through them and I will praise the Lord. So it's a declaration of the person's righteousness. Unrighteous people do not praise God. Um, I've observed over the years that people who praise God are ones who have good relationships with them and are righteous. The people who don't praise God are the people who are unrighteous for the most part. And I, you know, when I hear them talk about what's going on in their lives and stuff like that, I realize you know, there is no trust, there is no dependence. There's more concern about themselves than there's about God. And there are lots of reasons for that. Then 
in verse 20, you get to a, kind of a declarative statement where the people say, this is the gate of the Lord. And uh, one of the Hebrew grammarians said this could also be legitimately translated. This is the gate to the Lord through which the righteous shall enter. Well, right there, talking about the gate through which the righteous enter, defining the gate, would give the same meaning to verse 19, that these are the gates through which the righteous enter. Uh, this particular gate, when they get there, they say, this is it, this is the place, we found it, we're here. And uh, then they direct a prayer to God, I will praise you, for you have answered me, and you have become my salvation. Notice again, like in verse 14, you're not my savior, you're the God who is my salvation. If you have God, you have all the gifts that are wrapped up in God. Then it flips back to this really strange thing. The stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. It's the Lord's doing, it's marvelous in our eyes. Okay, so what's going on there? You have to figure out a setting in which this concept makes sense. And um, there's a lot of parallels to uh, Nehemiah. Um, most people think it's, a, it's actually named the date, the Feast of Tabernacles in 444 BC, when Nehemiah and Ezra reinstituted the uh, festival that had for you know, 70 years when they were gone, but not done. And then you have to realize that what preceded that was a rebuilding of the wall and the temple. So they could have a temple to go into because the first temple God had burned as a judgment on his uh, unrighteous worshipers. And one of the, the two things going in here, literally we can take a stone, uh, as builders are building things uh, from what I've read about people who build things like this, uh, they like to build their own cornerstone. You know, the cornerstone has to join two things together. It could also be an art stone, but a uh, cornerstone fits the use of the metaphor in the New Testament of Ephesians uh, 2, 20 churches built on the foundation of Christ and the prophets, the Messiah and the prophets. Um, so they didn't use a new stone. They used the old stone, which would have demonstrated a continuity with the old temple. And that makes a lot of sense that you have the old temple, and out of that comes the new temple, and out of that comes Christ. The other thought is that the uh, Israel is, is one spot where Israel is referred to, I think, as a stone. Um, and or what some interpreters think is a stone. And they were the people that were rejected. And now they are being put back into service, hence an additional reason for praise. I think of Martin Luther as he's there, rejected by so many, chased and hounded and persecuted, um, that he is thinking of, uh, yeah, I might have been rejected, but God is the one who had, preserves me. Uh, there's another spot where, um, oh, it's in Zechariah, I think. Uh, I think it's Zechariah. So Rubabel. Uh, is being anointed as the priest, and Satan is there accusing him, saying he's terrible and he's you know you can't use him. And uh, God says he's a firebrand plucked from the fire. I'm going to use him. So um, there's there's a lot of that imagery where what was cast off is then used by God uh, for His glory and therefore His grounds for praise. Uh, Isaiah, way before any of the exiles, uh, God is recorded as saying through Isaiah. I lay in Zion, Israel, a stone for a foundation, a proven, a tried stone, a precious cornerstone, a sure foundation, and whoever leaves will be unshaken. Um, King James and New King James totally blow it with, will not make haste, whatever that means. Uh, and the thought is, well, you're not going to have to make haste and run away and be scared. So, you know, they really should have cleared out the metaphor to make it that you're, you're trusting on a foundation, the rock that's solid. Uh, therefore, when troubles come, the earth might tremor, but if you are trusting on this you know, sure, tried foundation, bedrock stone, you will not be put to shame. 
So the if you put these two verses together, 21 and 22, uh, they were in distress. Uh, they were praying for the return while they were in Babylon. And then God brings them back and puts them as his uh, temple or in his temple for his praises. Uh, then they give praise. And then they can say, this was the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. Uh, I'm sure there are people who have just taken verse 23 out of context and made songs out of it. Um, oh, the Lord does great things. It's marvelous in our eyes. Not recognizing that, okay, you got to incorporate the cornerstone. You've got to incorporate the whole context to be able to come to a full appreciation of what the Lord does. And he takes off what's rejected and brings it back. Um, he's going to do this again when he returns. Uh, he's doing it right now. So, Second Peter 2 says that we are, so I guess I think I have First Peter 2. Um, let me go up here on this verse. Uh, Matthew 21, Jesus basically referred to him as the rejected cornerstone. Peter in his speech in Acts 4 refers to Jesus as the cornerstone. Uh, referring to the nation of Israel, this passage is quoted again in Romans 9. And uh, Ephesians 2.20 or so, it talks about the church being built on it. Uh, but First Peter 2 specifically talks about us being fitted together on Jesus, the chief cornerstone. Um, and Christians in Peter's day were the new people that were cast off, were persecuted, uh, were despised, were tortured. And they are brought into a temple to declare God's praises on the basis of uh the Messiah. So this is the Lord's doing. It was marvelous in our eyes. And then we have a verse that I uh, usually quote most mornings when I get out of bed. This is the day the Lord has made. I'll rejoice and be glad in it, even though I really don't want to. <laughs> um, sometimes it's good Lord morning, and then I realize, oh no, that should be good morning, Lord. Um, <laughs> and as I went through this, I thought, oh, um, you know, that really isn't talking about God creating. Uh, the word for made is made, one for appointed, as well as other things. I mean, it can be appointed, and it is a basic word for made, but it's not the word that's often used for created. It's not in the King James text. And um, if you realize this is the day of the Feast of Tabernacles that God had appointed as a... Um, festival to celebrate his goodness to them and that he's brought them back after disciplining them uh, then the fact that they are there is marvelous that the Lord does things like this so people can see it and praise him for it therefore we will be joyous and be glad in it and is this next verse now here they are they're back they got their temple they're praising God. Um, they're really happy. What more do you want? Well, now we got another pray request for save, salvation. Save now, I pray. O oh Lord, O oh Lord, I pray. Look at that. There's like some chaotic structure there. And then the prayer is send now prosperity. So I think so many believers are just content with, oh, my sins are forgiven. And then so many bogus prosperity gospel people think that you know salvation is not important but success material success is important um he they're asking i think this is send now prosperity is one word um cause us to prosper and this particular causative use of the word is used only two other times in a sense um it's used a bunch of times when it talks about um, some false prophecies about a king prospering against Jerusalem or against the Israelites. But two really kind of cool places. Nehemiah, when he is first going to rebuild the wall, it's like the first guy out, prayed in Nehemiah 1.11 that God would cause him to prosper in his service of the Lord. And then Second Chronicles 20.20 20 is the other spot where it's used. And that's the one where there's like multiple armies and nations gathered around Israel. They have no idea what to do. They call out to the Lord. The Lord sends a prophet to tell them to just go stand and see what the Lord does. 
And then uh, as they began to praise God, um, God caused all the armies to be slain. And I think it took them three days to carry off all the loot. So in the days before FedEx, God had to bring the loot to them because it would have taken you know, a huge journey to carry it, just to carry it from them. A quarter mile away to their camp, back to their city, uh, would have t- took them th- the nation three days. So it, he's asking God to continue to bless them. And if we understand that uh, what we have is because of God, that he's the one who's given us all the abilities and powers that we have, uh, then, and we recognize that he is the one who has saved us and is working in our lives, we can have confidence to ask that God would continue to bless us. And I believe that's what is going on here. They're continuing to ask God to prosper them as a people who are seeking to uh, do his will. Any questions on that one? Right, yeah, and God is the one who loves to bless. Uh, it, it, uh, he is doubly honored when he blesses us, first because it, he's keeping his word, and secondly because it shows that he is the source of all blessings and glory and power and honor. In fact, it was Solomon in his uh, uh, First Chronicles 29, dedication to the temple and seeing all this magnificence of the most magnificent temple the world had ever seen, um, says, hey, God, it's all come from you. Yours is the power and the greatness and the glory and the victory and the majesty and in all, indeed all that is in heavens and earth is yours. Which brings us to our last point, I think. Um, Roman number four, we receive his blessings and I'm just listing a few of them. Salvation in its full sense, fellowship and intimacy with God. I gave some hints on that, but I'm going to give you a little more now. Light, which is his favor and being able to uh, it's a form of glory. Peace, which we saw uh, when we did the fruit of the Spirit as one of the covenantal blessings. We receive these things when we are rightly related in him. Uh, and the sense of in there is in union with. Uh, I couldn't fit it on your outline, so I put in capital letters to highlight it. Uh, and for which we'll praise him uh, as Hesed for his loyalty. And as a result, we probably be what I should have put in there, but line was, I don't want to go into another line. <clears throat> so some people think this is the um, priest now coming out when you have this uh, horde of worshipers standing at the gate of uh, righteousness. And it's quite possible in its original context. That's what it was written for. Um And he says, or the psalmist goes on to write, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Um, So now it goes down from the nation to the individuals. And the priests are pronouncing a blessing on those who have made the pilgrimage to come in obedience to God's command to celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles. And one of the things that I suspect most people gloss over, because I didn't see any of the commentators say this, I going to look at all the commentators, who comes in the name of the Lord. What does that mean? Yahweh, here I am. Bless me. Eh, it's a little weak. Um, then it says, we have blessed you from the house of the Lord. So these are possibly the priests now saying, we have blessed you. So there was this way they're supposed to hold their fingers or whatever for the ironic blessing. It's a daily truth base. I've got a, a picture of it. Um, and from the house of the Lord, which is this place where the Lord dwells, from his presence, from his glory, they are now blessing and wishing good things on the people. Um, God is the Lord. And he has given us light. Bind the sacrifice with cords to the horns of the altar. Is the way most texts read the first word there. All right. So I'm looking at this and thinking, oh, yeah. Um, so the old 
Testament had horns that were supposed to be anointed with blood. Um, the thing is, you would sacrifice and slaughter the animal outside. Who was it? The, the main altar with the horns are. And then certain parts of the animal would be burned on the altar. And there would there'd be, there'd be actually a number of altars for roasting animals and stuff like that. Um, the pagans used to have to bind their sacrifices to the horns of an altar with rope to prevent the sacrifice from getting up and running away. Particularly if you're offering a human sacrifice, they tend not to lay there quietly as you slice them. Um, God doesn't tell his people to do that. And a number of commentators, and I'm going to believe them because I didn't want to spend all the time reading the entire Bible just for this one piece, that said there is no other spot in scripture that says you're supposed to bind the animal to this. So um, the NIV, that uh, I have a lot of respect for the way they did the Psalms in the Old Testament because in most spots, okay, they're not infallible. But uh, they had this idea of like festivals and uh, boughs of branches. And when I first saw it, I thought, eh, I wonder what caused them to translate it that way because the words don't, you know, and all the other translations don't match up. I looked at some of the more modern translations and they're all... Uh, not what the NIV says, but I think the noticeably incorrect version deserves the praise because they, I think they really got this one right. Um, the word for bind is the same word for join, all right? So you, you put together. And the word for sacrifice is really a stretch. The actual word is most frequently a festival or a festival procession, all right? It is a stretch to make this word be sacrifice. You can look it up in the online Bible on your own. Uh, and the word for cords is also a word for uh, boughs or uh, you know, branches. So the translation which the NIV puts in, which is pretty similar, is join the festival per procession with the sheaves that are actually put together to wave back and forth up to the horns of the altar, and they weren't allowed to go any further. So on the day, the Mishnah, uh, the way the uh, Jewish people used to do this in the second temple, which is the temple we're talking about that got reconstructed, is each day they'd go up once and walk around to the, the altar, and then the seventh day they'd go up seven times, and the, the priests are inviting um, the worshipers to come into the presence of God to praise him uh, with their wave offerings, uh, during this festival. And their phrase is, uh, Yahweh is God. He is the one who has given us light. He has shown us favor. He has caused his face to shine upon us. Um, and the blessing that the uh, priest would give out of number six is God commanded Moses to tell Aaron, this is how you shall bless my people. And say, the Lord bless you and keep you, which means protect you. The Lord make his face shine on you, which means you are, um, he's looking favorably upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. So it could be that 26 is an elaboration of verse 25, or it could also be, that there's two different aspects of God's light shining on them and the more intimacy uh, that his countenance has when they meet to him with him face to face. And he says, thus you will put my name, Yahweh, Yahweh bless you, Yahweh make his face shine upon you, Yahweh lift up his countenance upon you. Notice the Trinitarian use of Yahweh. Uh, you'll put my name on the children of people and I will bless them. So the prerequisite for getting blessed is to have his name on you. So, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. How do you get God's name on you? Find some Levitical priest to pronounce this over you and you're good to go? Eh, I don't think that's it. Um, so, let's think about 
Jesus saying, if you ask anything in my name, what does that mean? Or to do something in the name of an other. Um, have a power of attorney, you do something in the name of an other. Uh, you have their power and you carry out their will. The police will say, stop in the name of the law. Okay, the power comes from the law and the police is telling you to stop on the basis of what the law says. So one of the factors that goes into um, being in the name of the Lord is being in his will. It's submission to his name and power. When we ask anything in Jesus' name, the Father hears us. And we know if he hears us, we have the thing we ask of him, said Jesus in John 15. So what they're doing, I mean, what we have to do is be in submission to God's power. Um, be in submission to his person. Uh, we do what we do in the name of the Lord as his ministers, as his servants, as his ambassadors. Um, and it's on, in that context that we are able to get blessed. Um, and that, that's like you could say, uh, blessed is he who is a Christian. Nah, blessed is he who is a disciple. That's a lot better um, because a disciple is the follower who is submitted to God and his power and his will. And then we have, I think the last two verses, you are my God and I will praise you. Note here the real personal aspect, uh, the fellowship and intimacy that the psalmist has. Um, you are my God and because you'll help me, I will praise you. You are my God and because you'll protect me and care for me, I will praise you. You are my God, and I will exalt you. So it's like a delirious, you know, hilarious, rah, um, shouting uh, goes beyond. It's a heightened form, so it goes from praise to exaltation. And I'm sure this is one of those verses that uh, would have um, given great comfort to Martin Luther. Uh, he, Martin Luther kind of didn't quite get James, didn't quite get Revelation, didn't get Christ quite like coming back. He, he wasn't super strong in that, but I'm sure now he is has other reasons to praise God for when Christ returns, uh, he will be a really chief and um, choice servant of God. And then the general exhortation to everyone else is, oh, give thanks to the Lord for he is good. He gives good gifts to his children and his hesed endures forever. His loyalty does not end, regardless of any of our circumstances. I think that's uh, about all we have time for. Any other questions or thoughts? I would encourage you to think through these guys here. Uh, you know, count your blessings, name them by one one. Don't forget what God's done, as the song says. Um, the thing which I would encourage people to do is if you think, as you think of your blessings, ask, why has God blessed us? Because he wants the praise. It's the theology of um, blessing. Is God blesses so that people can hear about it. And if God doesn't get any glory from his blessings for you, Frankly, why should he do it? Um, being righteous is a requirement of uh, blessing, and the response is a way of ensuring the blessings. Um, the other one is that I want you to give some, uh, what does it mean to come in the name of the Lord? And then this little uh, example, uh, you know, you can do it on your outline, or you can just pull down the passage, um, you have some program and do it in, on your computer. Uh, circle each of God's attributes. You know, he's good, he's loyal, he's a helper. Um, and then check off the blessings. So he gives good things, he saves, uh, he helps. Those are actually, it's a blessing. It comes right out of his character. 
and then put a little box or triangle or whatever else you want to do, a different color highlighter, around the responses that we should make in response to what he's done. So God's done something, he's revealed himself, we respond to his revelation, that's worship, and then go do him. Okay, let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you that you are a God who is good, who is infinitely good, a God who is loyal, who is infinitely loyal, a God who has power and might, who helps his people, who saves them, who delivers them, who prospers them, who does so much for him so that we can reflect your glory to those around us. Um, may you cause us to live and praise you, for that is why you created us. We ask this in Christ's name. We bless our fellowship in Christ's name. Amen.